to the word of the Lord, we have everyone to stand. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus says, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you were dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate what kind of death which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Lord, we thank you for your word. Transform us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll release the kids at this time. We're glad you're here today. We have, um, as a church, the Lord has blessed us in so many ways, and it's hard to describe that, even as Sherilyn was saying earlier. There's so many blessings that the Lord has given us, and, and it is such an awesome thing to serve the Lord and to live for Him. Sometimes we take for granted that the Lord is with us, and it is such a tiny offering to give to Him, and as I was thinking this week, praying and dealing with life in general, I am so grateful for the journey he has taken us all on. I'm glad that all of us have intersected lives together. There's a reason for that. And some of it is that we add value to somebody else's life. They add value to your life. The great thing about the church is the bride of Christ, that our interaction is that for that very purpose. That's why the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling together of the believers because there is something usually that a person here can add to your life or you can add to their life that it's so unique that nobody else will be able to do. That's why I say it's so important that when we gather as a church that we're here and it's gather as a church that we come as intact as we can. I challenge the worship team that when we come in that we've got to come in ready to worship. We've got to come in with our stuff kind of laid to the side you can't come in and, and, and I know we've all tried it doesn't work well when we come in and we've got all this junk from the week just on us and you come in to sing carry me through and if you got a lot of junk on you that's a very convicting song it's one of those things that when you start singing oh hell the power of Jesus name and you've had one of those weeks where the strength is uh, not there and the weakness seems to be overtaking us I find that it is important that whatever God is doing in our lives, we allow him to enhance that through his word, through worship. That's why this worship team, I appreciate them. They're willing to come in and lead in worship, but also they're willing to have things intact so that when they do come in, that it is something that we can enter into that place. But life being a journey, one of the things that we can peek into is people's lives in Scripture. Most of us, we see those, and one of the great things that I like doing in Scripture is I like looking at people's lives and figuring out what really makes them who they are. We get to see their mess-ups. We get to see their good things. We get to see it all. I'm glad they're not recording that in our lives so that everybody in the generations to come, but are they? They are. You think about your grandkids, your great-grandkids. You think about your kids. What you are doing is the pattern that is playing out and is what they're going to do. That's why I tell people it's so important to live your life without regrets. To live your life in such a way that is before the Lord, you minimize those regrets. You don't want to live your life to where when you look at somebody in your family and say, well, don't do it the way I did it, but do it this way. That's kind of a hard way to live. When we peek in at Peter's life, we see a bunch of stuff. I mean, there's everything from good to bad to ugly. I mean, this is Clint Eastwood in a making of a movie right there. 
You'll find yourself as you peek into him that he was one that was called, and I can see that call that when Jesus called him to leave your fishing nets, come on and follow. And as you look at just the first part of his life, I don't know, put yourself there. Just think about Jesus. Now, we have a hard time when God calls us to go down to Walmart to talk to somebody. Can you imagine Jesus coming to you and saying, you know, stop doing what you're doing and come on and follow me. Now, we don't get the luxury in Scripture of saying that maybe Jesus pulled him aside and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to change the world. He didn't do that. Maybe there were some things on a personal level that we didn't get to see, but there was something that happened when Jesus spoke his words to Peter's heart, and he said, just come on and follow. Now, for you to set aside your livelihood, to set aside everything, to go follow somebody that really was starting to stir, it really wasn't the biggest stir as it could have been, but when the people are giving you an account of who Jesus was, so there was a, I, I put this, a white hot passion of the Lord that was planted in Peter that day. It was the fire of God. Now think about in your life, when you first came to know Jesus Christ, that's your starting of your journey. Now I would challenge you today, there's some folks that maybe your journey has, and I've talked to older folks that said their journey has been progressive over the years. But there's got to be a point in every one of our lives where we came face to face with the Savior and Lord of this world who asked us to make a decision for Him. Think back on that moment. Now, some of us have strayed from that. Some of us have walked to that. Some of us have stayed with that. There's different variances of that journey, but there, every journey in here with God has to have a starting slash restarting point with Jesus Christ, where you came face to face with the reality that you need a Savior. I don't know if that's what Peter felt. Maybe it's what, and I look at Mike back here, the softball field that night. We prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart. That was a starting of a journey that who would have thought that you're right here even today of where you are. But in that journey, you've seen this, just as Peter. We've all seen it. You think back on your childhood commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you who grew up in church like I did, that Lord Jesus Christ came to you and it was a point that even growing up in the church, you grew up in the church, you spent, I spent umpteen times in church. You know, you had to go. It was just part of what you did. But it wasn't until that moment you came face to face with Jesus in the spiritual sense. I never saw him face to face, but I came to that place that my journey truly began. Everything changed for me at that point going from 6th grade to 7th grade. A lot of changes were happening. We went from Rocky Ridge to Gresham, didn't and we found ourselves in a different group of people. You find yourselves in some choices that you have to make. But I'm glad that I met Jesus in that summer right between the 6th and the 7th going to Gresham Junior High School. That was a transformative moment. Peter had this transformative moment where he was just, maybe he was a passionate fisherman. I probably think he was because you see the passion that comes out in him. You could probably ask Peter anything about fishing. He'd probably tell you everything you want to know about fishing and nothing you really care to know. He'd give you everything you want to know about every way you catch a fish, every kind of way you can scale a fish, every way you can do a fish, and even how you can make money doing so. Maybe he was the guy that was guy, the go-to guy that had all the passion you wanted to know about in fishing. But Jesus saw something in him. And when he saw that passion in Peter, he said, I'm inviting you to take who you are to come with me. Wow, what about that? Peter bought into a vision at this point. Now, this vision was very limited. Understand that. We, when God calls us, most of the time as a young person, I can tell you this, when God called me at 17 years old, he said, I want you to go preach. Well, I'm sitting here in a very hesitant stance going, I really don't know where I'm going, God, and I really don't know if I want to go there. And I really had my own reluctance because at 17 years old, you don't see too many doing this. And so you're kind of going, I don't know about this, God. I'm a son of a construction worker. How in the world is this thing going to work? When God puts a calling on your life, he bursts a fire into that calling. He bursts a vision. And the bad thing that he does is he gives you this calling, but he doesn't lay it out there for you, does he? He said, okay, here's how you're going to do it. You're going to take this step. When he said, Peter, come follow me, it wasn't that he laid out everything for Peter. And that's the problem with we in America today a lot of times, that when Jesus calls us to come follow him, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to say, give me your plan, God, and let me see if I want to accept that plan. 
Give me the things that you're going to do in my life, and let me see if I'm going to like that 50 years down the road before I say yes to that. The problem with that, that's not the way God works. Sherilyn's sitting here, and you think about the time that, you know, you look back on Sherilyn's life, and you see the ups and downs and all arounds that she's been through, and she'll tell you about that. But for her to get here to this place, not just to New Hope, but to this place in God, to get to this place, this journey, Grandma Sandy's here. To get to this place in this journey, somewhere you had to say yes, and I will say on blind faith. That's the hard part. That's the part that you look at Peter's life and you think, how in the world can this fisherman, the provider of his home, would look at this, and when he looked in this man's eyes, he saw something of trust. He said, okay. How do you throw everything to the side and throw caution to the wind and say, okay, let's go? Let's walk away from what I know to something that I don't even know where I'm going. Okay, that's the journey that Peter was called to. Not too dissimilar from the journey we're called to. If Larkin would have known, I don't know how many years ago now, if he had known eight years ago, bumping into Debbie or somebody, no, it was through the Southeastern Bible College. Bumping into people. If he had known that this journey that God was taking him on, it wasn't laid out for him. And I'm using people in this congregation because if, if it was laid out, he would have said, but wait a minute, I need some questions. And you have done that. I know you have. I've done it. I need some questions answered before I say yes. Young people, take encouragement in this. You're not going to get your questions answered. You're not. You're going to say, wow, I've got to follow you, Jesus, and you're going to tell me each day? I want to know what's going to happen next year. No, no. When Peter looked at Jesus, he said, okay. Now, that is one of the most stressful points in your life, but is one of the greatest adventures you'll ever sign up for when you say that okay, when you say yes, Lord. There are pivotal points in every one of our lives. We all have that. There are places that we all walk into and we go, I'm not sure if I'm where I'm supposed to be, but by golly, I know God's called me here, so I am here. As I look around this room, and I know the journeys of so many of you, I've seen what God has called you to, and I've seen that the ups, downs, and all arounds of even your life. I've watched that. You've seen it in my life. We've all seen it together, but the journey is what Jesus called Peter into. He didn't just call him into a vocation. He didn't just call him into this thing of activities. He called him to a journey. You know what this journey included? It included that vision that Jesus placed in him. It included the change that he was going to write all about Peter. The journey included inside out. Everything was going to be different. Now, in this journey that God calls us to, a lot of times we want to put all the conditions on it. We want to put all the things to say, okay, you can take me on this journey, God, as long as, number one, you don't embarrass me. How many of y'all have done that? I've done it. Just don't put me in a place where I'm uncomfortable, God. Don't put me in a place where I don't have the tools to do what you call me to do. Well, if you look inside and just peek inside Peter's life again, how many things is he called to do he was not equipped to do? You'll even find out that later in Acts, and you'll see as they bring him up before Sanhedrin, they look at him and say, these unschooled, unlearned learned people, these basically ignorant fishermen. Wow. That's not, I mean, even after hanging out with Jesus for that long, they're still known as the unschooled, unlearned, the ones that really didn't have what it takes. But that's what God calls. A friend of mine, Stuart Dyer, who we went to college together, he always loved that line. God doesn't want your, uh, uh, it's about your availability. It's not about your ability, it's about your availability. That's what he's calling us to. Ollie, when he was working in the barbecue stand and all those years, and how in the world did that prepare you to go on these mission trips and to do construction? How in the world did you look at it that you look, okay, in this journey, Ollie, I'm going to call you to be leaders among your peer, 
that you're going to go and you're going to reconstruct homes, but you're going to be a witness in these communities. These are things we look at and say, there's no way I can do these things, God. I, I, I have cut meat for a living. and I have had sold barbecue. I've done these things. How in the world in this journey that you're calling me to, how is this going to work? But I've watched it. I've watched people's lives transition after they say yes to the journey of God. You watch in Peter's life as you look at him and you see what God was doing in him. And I want you young people to be encouraged in this because God will always call us to a place where we can't accomplish. Wow. He will always call us to a place that will take more than what we have that we bring to the table. When he brought us into this vision, he didn't know how large and consuming this vision was going to be. He took Peter and he, and he saw him as this reed blowing in the wind to make him to the rock. He took him from that place of confusion in his own life and thinking at times that he had the the picture when he told Jesus at one time in his confession he said you are the Christ the son of God and then just just about you know I mean they even left the room and Jesus talking about how he's gonna die and Jesus says and Peter's like no we ain't gonna let that happen and then Jesus turns to him and says I rebuke that in the name of Jesus I, I rebuke that Satan you get out of this thing and so you see this confession, the confusion. You see great insight he had. But you also see the slowness he had to comprehend the deeper meanings of what Jesus was doing. When they really were talking about, and they, they get into this struggle of who's going to be the greatest. You see the confusion and the confession and the great confession he had to the great denial you'll see in the scripture we just read earlier. What a journey you see. And we all get down on Peter because he's one that's in the Easter story as the guy that really turned away. But I will ask you this. How are you doing in your journey? How close are you to God? If he called you, and this is what I I look back in my life and and I get my conviction comes a lot of times when that passion dims for Christ as a minister and I go through the motions, the conviction of God comes in And he starts saying, look, I'm just not after your confession. I want your confession and your passion. Because confession without passion becomes a profession. I don't want that. I don't want to be a professional Christian who goes to church because it's my job. I don't want to be that person that just kind of hangs out around God but never knows God. I want to be that person that has not only the confession but the passion to go along with that confession. And so Peter, he had great passion. You see him in the garden where he's going to take the sword and and cut the servant and and defend Jesus and cuts the ear off. Jesus heals the ear, fortunately, because Peter wasn't the greatest swordsman in the world. He's a fisherman. What do you know? I mean, let's let's scale some things. That's what I do. That's what fishermen do, scale things. So no big deal. We see in Peter's life and we wonder what happens to sit on this seashore and you see Jesus come along and it says that when he finished eating, it said, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he uses the word agape, which means the highest form of love. Peter comes back with him. I am your friend. I am your friend. He kept saying that, you know. I am your friend. He was somebody that when the journey started, he had great passion. He looked at Jesus. He said, in this journey, I'm going to be everything that God's called me to be. I want to be that. That's what my heart is all about. And he found himself, and in, in, you know, the great thing, and I will tell you this, in the journey that calls each one that God calls us to, your weaknesses are going to be revealed. That's scary. That is so scary. And your weaknesses are revealed a lot of times in what you think is your strength. Your weakness can be revealed in your own pride. Man, when, when all of a sudden you think, I have got it together. That's why when Peter, in his journey, when he said, they may all leave you, but I ain't going anywhere. That's the southern vernacular, Donnie. They may all walk away from you, God, but you can count on me. I got it. I'm with you, man. I got this, this, this passion you put in me. I will go to my death defending you. Wow. <laughs> now fast forward to the seashore. Fast forward when he, the, the rooster crowed. And then, here's Peter, and, and I'm, I don't know if it, if you, you know, when you have that moment where the bell rings and you kind of go, that first denial, you know, maybe it did, second denial, but then the third one, boy, when that hit, and I guarantee you, back somewhere that was swirling, because there was a lot that was swirling, don't get me wrong, 
If you've ever been in one of those high intense situations, that's what he was in. Jesus just being arrested. He was in the midst of a bunch of enemy folk. He was in the midst of people that were looking at him. They were looking for Jesus' followers to arrest. They were looking for all these things. I can understand. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. No big deal. In our journey, folks, he takes the very thing that we think is our strength and he turns it upside down. He says, I want to show you where your strength is found. It's going to be found in your weakness. In that place that you look at and you go, there's, there's no way. Because even as I, I look around this room, what we think that God is preparing us for a lot of times is not exactly where we're going to end up. I look at Matthew sitting on the front row. He accepted a call to the ministry. I have no idea where God's going to take you, but I know he's leading you somewhere. I have no idea if you look at your own life and you go, how in the world can I go from this point to this point? You know, if you look at preachers standing, I can remember growing up with preachers thinking, I don't fit there. There's no way I'll fit there in the pulpit. That just wasn't me. I couldn't visualize it, but God's got his plan. He's got his purposes. He's got exactly in this journey what he wants, but he's going to turn you upside down. He's going to take and he's going to say, that's enough of your strength. I see your strength, Peter. Your strength got that guy's ear cut off. That was your strength, but I'm going to show you a strength like you've never known. Only after you have met your weakness. Only after you in this journey embrace that weakness. This seashore adventure that he has with Jesus, and, and, I, and I, like I say, when I look at Peter's life, I see so many similarities in so many people's lives. We all think that, man, I would be that person would never leave Jesus. I'd never walk away. I've had those points in my life where I, I can remember this one point. It was a dark point in my life that I, I, can, I can just remember weeping, weeping bitterly, as they said Peter did after he denied Christ. I was at the Pentecostal church, and I was not where I was supposed to be, and, and we were in an event that I wasn't supposed to be at, and I can remember lying on my face at that event and just weeping like a baby. Asking, Lord, please forgive me. If I, and honestly, here's my prayer. If I get out of this place alive, I will never come back again. And I was at a spiritual gathering event, but there was witchcraft and things going on that was ugly. And y'all think, witchcraft? Yeah, it happens in churches too. Soulish manipulation is all it is. And I told the Lord, laying there weeping, laying there weeping, I said, God, when I leave this mountain retreat, I'm done. I'm broken. I'm out. Because you know what? I, he reminded me, and he said, because I have done the Peter thing. I will never, never deny you, God. Folks, I'll tell you, there are times that we deny Christ so many times in our life. He'll ask us to do things, and he'll ask us not to do things, and we'll choose to do, not to do. You know, denying his voice is that exact same thing. When he tells us to go and, would you go and ask forgiveness for this event of your life? And you go, no, I really don't want to do that because that will cause too much pain to me, even though it could bring healing to everybody else. Does that look like a form of denial to you? It does to me. It does in my life. That's the way I treat it. You can treat it how you want to as an excuse. But I look at it when God calls us to do something and it produces humility in us and we choose not to do it. Hmm. I got to put my rocks up and quit throwing them at Peter <laughs> preachers we all pick on Peter because in his journey he has such a great fallacies about him he has such great falterings about him that we look at and we go wow can you believe this guy we wouldn't say that out loud but that's what we think how in the world could he walk with Jesus for those years be the bold one to tell him he's the Christ and say no I look at my own life though God starts calling, and I say, Oof, I don't want to do that. Before we went to Cherokee, Alabama, and I'm sharing a few journeys with you today. Before I went to Cherokee, Alabama, to get back in the Coma Presbyterian Church, there was a season that I went through, and I remember it culminated one day, and I was sitting there broken, sitting on the stairs, thinking, and this is my honest and goodness thoughts, because I thought, God, will you ever use me again? But I sat there on those steps thinking, I have no idea where I'm going or what I'm doing. And that's when I'd called up churches and then nobody wanted me. <laughs> you got a preacher? I, I, I want to be a preacher. But you find yourself in that dilemma of total weakness, total, your strength gone. There's nothing left. You sit on the seashore of Jesus and he looks at you in the eyes and say, do you love me? And he's asking, will you, will you come back and fellowship with me again? 
Will you come back and be in love with me with such a passion that people see it? And all you can answer is say, I, I, will, I will be your friend. I'll do the best I can. That's a broken man. We can fault him for not using the agape love back to God, but I look at him as a broken man. I look at him as a journey-filled person that looks at it and says, I can't promise you this, but I'm going to work on this being your friend. How many times have you recommitted your life to Jesus Christ and you sat there and the preachers preached those sermons and you're going, I need this, I've got to have this. And then you get up there and you pray and then you walk out and the next thing you know, things are turning upside down again in your life and, and you're back to where you were. I am so grateful. And the reason why I love this story is I'm so grateful that Jesus finds us where we are. He speaks to us in the vernacular in which we know and he accepts us and loves us exactly to what we can give well that's hard to understand how in the world it wasn't too long after i sat there on those stairs trying to wonder what in the world you're doing god but in this journey he was taking me through he had to burn out something because i always thought outside the denomination was the greener grass I always thought that there was other places and other things and one day that this, that, and the other. And I had these things in my mind of what was really what God was calling me to. And he said, no, here's what's going to happen, Donnie. Are you ready to listen now? All those things to the side. Are you ready to hear me? And I'll appreciate to the day I die, um, Reverend Warren, up in, he was at the Florence Church for so long. I was his youth pastor back when I was in college. And the, I don't even know why he had me, to be honest with <laughs> you. I learned a lot from the man. He didn't get anything from me hardly, but he, I learned a lot from him. He calls me back up, and etched out of the blue, Brother Don Thomas had told him to call me. He calls me up out of the blue, and he says, Donnie, would you be interested in coming back and pastoring a church up here in Cherokee, Alabama? They need a pastor. Just out of the blue. I remember one Saturday morning, and I, I can remember sitting there going, okay. I don't think I told Mindy. <laughs> okay. She got tired of seeing me miserable. And that starts another journey. Does that solve all things? No. It just starts the journey again. It was like a reset button for me. It was one of those things that God is, and this is what he's doing with Peter on the store. He's doing a reset button for him. He said, Peter, I love you. I want you back on your journey. Peter was floundering. Peter was trying to figure out what do you do once you've denied the very Savior that you love, the one that you said you would follow him, you had such a passion for, and then you wake up one morning and you have denied him and you have walked away from that very passion that he called you to, but yet you're still the same person. You still have the same passion. You still have the same desires. And then Jesus meets you where you are and he says, look, I'm going to regroup things. Here's a reset for you. Do you love me? Give me what you can. Give me what you can. I appreciate the Matthews. I appreciate the Larkins, the David Linskys who's preaching today. I appreciate the Larry DeBoers. I look at the journey that Larry and I have intersected over the years, and it's been a great journey. We have gone, and to take a man of his stature and his age, and I look at him and I go, I want that journey. I want to finish well. I want to do everything I can to finish well. I want to have that life that what Peter was asking for, he was saying, yes, Lord, I love you, but take it easy on me. I'm just a man. <laughs> Be gentle. I'm not where I thought I was, but I know where I am now. I'm in great need of your grace. I'm in great need of your power to transform me. Where am I going with all this? I look at this and I see here's a couple of things I want you to hear. God, to get Peter from that place where he saw him as that reed, the one blowing in the wind, to the rock, it only happens through Jesus' encounters. It can happen at church. It can happen outside. It can happen in other places. But here's what I ask of you. In your life, make sure you're having daily Jesus encounters. If that has not taken place, I would dare to say, and as I was telling the band today, there's no such thing as a static Christian walk. You're always sliding backwards. You've got to be pressing forward in the passion of God. If you're sitting here today and say, well, I'm okay with Jesus, but there's no pursuit of him, you're in a, you're in a slide backwards right now. 
the static walk that we think that we can arrive somewhere. Guys, this is our problem, and I'll tell you guys this. We always look for in our marriage relationship the cruising altitude. And where the conflict comes in, the wife always knows it can be better. We think, I've got the garbage out. I've done this. I've done that. We're cruising along. I've, I'm good with this. I give you 10 touches a day is what a woman needs. 10 non-sexual touches. That's Jamie's joke. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. I'm done for the day. <laughs> we want to have that cruising out to it. God says it can always be better. And when Gary Smalley said this, said, if you want to know how your marriage is doing, don't ask your wife because if you ask her, she'll tell you. <laughs> and she's the one that's got the marriage manual in her. She'll let you know. How's it going? Ask her that sometime. But I wanted to do, go further than that. Ask the Lord, how's my relationship to you? He'll sit on the seashore with you. You'll eat some fish together, and he'll say, do you love me? Do you love me? I'm going to create a passion. Feed my sheep. I'm going to create a passion back in you. So to take us from that reed to the rock, it's to take us from that brokenness inside out. Do you embrace brokenness when it comes your way? I'm talking about, or do you fight it? And what I mean by that, when somebody tells you you're wrong, can you apologize? Can you stop at that moment and say, look, I, I've just, man, I'm wrong. Sorry. And then the brokenness from inside out means that there's a restoration of soul. And that can only come by the healing of the Holy Spirit. What I mean by restoration of soul, if you've got a brokenness inside out, then what God wants to do is your mind, your will, and your emotions to be set free from the wounds of the past. And he wants that healing to be done by the Spirit of God that's enforced through the Word of God. And you cannot have the healing by the Spirit of God unless the Word of God is ministering to your soul, your mind being transformed, your will being made new, and your emotions being set free. If you're allowing God to do that, then you, valued, you're, you find this valued place in a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what he was doing with Peter that day on the seashore. He was bringing him back to a place of value. That's where I started this thing. We're all to add value. But what he did with, with Simon Peter sitting on the seashore that day, he said, Peter, I value you more than you even understand. He came to him. Think back on your own life. How many times have you walked away from the very passion that God has called you to, but it's been Jesus who's come back to you? He may come through an aunt, uncle, grandmother, somebody else. And he may just, it may be just something he drops into your ear and says, this is what, you know, go do this. And you're going, that don't make a bit of sense, but God always values. He's one pursuing us. And then he taps into the grace through the humility. And this is where Peter, because he asked the third time, Simon Peter, do you love me? He uses the word, the friendship word in Greek. And Peter was hurt because he asked the third time. Maybe it's because he came down to his level. But he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, in this process, please understand, I believe Jesus was healing him too. He met him by the Spirit of God. He met him where he was. He spoke to the very wound that Peter had because he had denied him. And he got him to the point of saying, Peter, I want you to understand. I have pursued you. I love you. And yes, yes. I do know all things. That's why he went on and said, feed my sheep. And he went on to tell him how he's going to die. Peter tapped into the grace through humility because he understood the brokenness of God. He understood there was something in what this interaction with Jesus. And I will tell you this, that most of us in this place have had an interaction with Jesus at some point in our lives. Most of us have come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you this. If we are not walking in obedience of where we are right now, what we're supposed to be doing, there's a certain amount of denial that feels like in your soul. Not that you're denying Christ totally. Not that you're going to hell. It's just there's a point where we deny the callings of God on our life. And in our journey, the most critical aspect is that we walk with Jesus. That we are in relationship with Jesus. It comes through humility. It comes through brokenness. Peter had to have this brokenness because you'll find he's the one that stood up on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit came because God had appointed and anointed him to preach. And when he preached on that day, it said thousands came to know the Lord. And then he walked around and he did the healings. He did the miracles. This was a man with a newfound journey because he had been healed and restored because of what Jesus had done. And it wasn't even because he was pursuing Jesus. It was because Jesus pursued him. 
Yes, he did say yes to him on that day. Yes, there was still some brokenness that God had to work through him. Yes, there was some still changes. You'll find later that Peter had to be rebuked by Paul because he didn't want to associate with anything but Jews. And so he had to have him find another rebuke. But there was an easier embracing because of the restoration that had taken place. Now let me give you this, what I believe that each one of us can do. And this is the to-do part of the sermon today. Hugh, you didn't steal my thunder, but I am going to use part of Friday because I do believe there's some aspects that we need to learn through the relational factor. When he told the church in Laodicea, and this is a restoration of that church, he told them that, as Hugh said earlier, there is a lukewarmness about you. He said, I wish that you would be either hot or cold. He said, you are saved. This is what the church said to him in, in, the, in the Revelation there in the third chapter. It says, you say I'm rich, I've acquired much wealth, do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, poor, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Then he goes on and tells them what they need to do. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire where you can become rich, white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. These are three things I want to tell you to do in the restoration. If you're in a journey with Jesus, you're not where you need to be, three things you need to do today. Number one, put some salve on your eyes. What do I mean by that? There's a lot of things that get in the way of what you see in Jesus. A lot of things in your life. To put a salve on your eyes, you need a healing. It says that we're supposed to keep our eyes fixed on the author and the finisher of our faith. It says that we're supposed to run this race with Jesus in sight. Putting a salve on your eye means that you're going to awaken to his passion again. Ask God to do that. To put a salve on your eyes. When it says in Ephesians, the first chapter, that we're to enlighten the eyes of our heart. Enlighten these eyes. Put a salve on my Let me see things how you see them, God. Now, be careful with that prayer. Because when you pray that prayer, he's liable to tell you how he sees you. Be careful with it. Because sometimes we have an inflated view of ourselves. We think we're the best thing that God has gotten. We would never say that out loud. But we think, God, you got a good deal when you got me. Look how faithful I am. Look how good I am. Look how I do these things where these people don't do these things. Look at me, God. you got a deal. We need salve for eyes so we can see things in reality. We can see the purposes of God. We can see those things that God is calling to. But see your life and assessment of how God sees it. Are you really as passionate as you used to be? Or are you just playing games? You're bumping along. Your heart's crying out. As you're going down the road, your heart's crying out. And it's like there's no fire down here. It's cold. And that's your heart crying. He's not asking you to go through the motions. He said, get some salve for your eyes. Let, see the things the way God sees them. Let him show you those things. He said, put the salve on your eyes so that you can see. The second thing that I'm going backwards on this, the second thing he says is that I want you to take and I want you to the white clothes so you can cover your shamefulness. In other words, when God comes to us, he wants to deal with our stuff that gets in the way of us seeing him. He wants to get in the way of what we call righteousness. That's really not. He wants us to put on the white robe means the righteousness of God. He wants us to seek his kingdom first, which is that righteousness of God. He wants us to seek the right standing with him. The only way that can take place is if Jesus interjected in our journey. And what he did with Peter, he restored Peter back to a relationship in righteousness. Because sometimes that means we've got to get those things out of our life. Peter had to get past even forgiving himself in order to see Jesus again in order to see, be clothed. Because all Peter could see, and when you walked away from God, the only thing you can see, and you go back to Genesis on this, is your own nakedness. There's nothing you can do to clothe that. We'll come into church. Hey, how you doing? How you do? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. We try to cover our nakedness by a front. When everything in your heart is crying out and saying, it ain't right, this is not right. We try to cover our nakedness through good works. Oh, I will go out and I will do this, and I appreciate, uh, and I'll go back to Ollie. I appreciate a man like him who will go and do the good works, but I know Ollie's heart. He doesn't do them for approval of God. He doesn't. He does them because he loves God. We try to cover our nakedness through our works. We try to cover our nakedness through not letting everybody see, and God's saying, no, my righteousness is what covers your sinfulness, not yours. Our righteousness is filthy rags, is what the Bible says, compared to him. And the last thing you'll see, they said, I, I, I want to counsel you. You say you're rich, but you're really poor. Here's what, he's turned this thing upside down. He said, you really want to be rich? 
Buy gold that's been refined by fire. What that means, get the stuff that's going to last. Look at it as things are going to last. You want a relationship with Jesus? A lot of the temporal things that we chase after, God's saying, look, you can't chase after those things and have me. Those things don't go together. You can't chase after the world and hey, say, hey, I've got one foot in the world and I've got to be of the world so I can witness of Jesus. No, 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 no. We've got to be so kingdom-minded that we see things the way God sees them. That we actually clothed in his righteousness and it says, I want you to be rich. How are we rich in this life? That means we buy those things that are eternal, those things that are going to matter. Moth and rust will not corrupt those things. Now, my challenge to you today, how are you with Jesus? How close are you walking? I'm not asking you to do anything. What I'm asking you to do is ask Jesus. You ask him. What do I need to do? You ask Jesus to look in your heart. I don't care what age we are. You ask him to look in your heart. How's the fire going in my heart? Have I got eyes to see? I need salve on that. Am I clothed in your righteousness? Or am I just putting up a front trying to cover my nakedness because I am pretty ugly? And I don't want anybody to see that. I'm going to tell you something. If you've ever been in a place where you've been denied by somebody knowing you, that kind of thing, or somebody that's just kind of put you aside. Have you ever been there to where you've been ex excluded? Umpteen times that and say, that's what Jesus felt. But yet he came back to Peter and he said, I'll be your friend. I'll do it. I'll sign up for this thing again. You denied me. All I'm asking you to do is get back in the journey with me. Sad for his eyes. Righteous for his clothing and eternal perspective. That's how you're rich. How you doing with Jesus? Ask him, how's your relationship? Let's pray together. Father, as we are in this place, we know it's only through Christ and Christ alone. I ask you, Lord, that as Peter had this journey, there is nothing that we can do. We cannot work our way back to you. In fact, our righteousness is filthy rags, so we need something more than what we can produce. And so, Father, I ask you that even today that you show us how is our relationship to you. Ask, Lord, you meet with us here in these brief moments now. Just meet with us here, and you show us. Is there a fire in our heart? Are we clothing ourselves with our own righteousness? Are we putting up a front because we wouldn't want anybody to see our nakedness and we think nobody can see it? When everybody can see it, that we're playing games. And most of all, you can see it. Meet us here on this seashore today and ask us the question that we need to be asked. Do we love you? Do we love you, Lord? There is nothing we can produce or do to make you love us more. Nothing. While we were yet sinners, you died for us. You loved us. You pursued us. There is nothing we can do to make you love us more. You love us. Wow. So, Father, to make this journey sweet to make it awesome, to make it purpose-filled. May our relationship to you be restored in every way. First through salvation, and then through a renewing of your spirit day by day, through your word regenerating us. Thank you for that, Father. Here's what I'm going to ask. We're going to sing all to Jesus, I surrender. If you have a prayer need today, if God has sparked something in your heart saying, man, I just, I, I need this area. I got to pray about this thing. I need my eyes to see. I need, gosh, I need his righteousness. I'm playing games. Or I want a good perspective on life. I need to buy that gold. I invite you to come for prayer. Let's stand together as we sing.
His presence Nothing that we can do that can ever make you love us more. But Lord, we thank you for your peace, your understanding that you give us, even that when we walk away from your purposes and plans, that you give us that restoration moment in our journey. We ask you, Father God, that you would just allow your Holy Spirit just to move in our church here and just draw us back to your heart. We thank you, Father God, for your blessing upon this congregation. As, as we go from this place, may we be in this journey with you and your restorative power that you do each day. May we follow after you with everything that's in us. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your blessings. I ask you, Lord, that your grace, your mercy just open up the heavens and just lead us and direct us in your place and your power. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for your love and your kindness. And I ask you, Lord God, that you would just move in each person's life to reaffirm them in this journey. Thank you for that, Father. We bless you. And thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we praise you. I want you to go in the peace of God as you walk out of here today. Go in the peace of God and walk with God. In Jesus' name. <laughs>